I don't care if you're in school or not. This video is going to be one of the most important things you will ever watch in your entire life. Because if you want a better life, it starts with a better brain. And the only way to upgrade your brain is through efficient and effective learning. Your brain is a biological supercomputer. If you've been uploading data into your skull using dial-up internet, how are you going to compete with someone using a fiber optic hookup? When you learn something, you want it to stick. You want it to transform you. You want to be able to apply it in the real world. Each thing you learn should be what I call a forever tool. Easily available, easily accessible, not forgotten in some dusty drawer somewhere or made of jello. If you're Batman, it goes right into your fancy yellow Batman fanny pack. In this video, I'll teach you the most effective way to learn. As a board certified doctor with three Ivy League degrees, I owe a lot of my success to this very system. Quite literally, it is the most fundamental skill you could ever learn. For with it, you gain the super power to do almost anything. And it all starts with the first thing, understanding the brain. Your brain is an almost infinite sized warehouse. It starts off empty and devoid of information, but as you learn and grow, packages start to come in. Aisle five is the fruit section, aisle six is philosophy, and aisle seven is math. It may not feel like it sometimes, but your brain is amazing at learning. When inspired, it absorbs information like a sponge. You want someone to understand the importance of math? Don't start with random equations. Start with what's in it for them. Start talking about the time value of money and what Billy owes you from that $10 loan you gave him three weeks ago for Pokemon cards. Oh, sorry, Billy, you didn't read the fine print? Those $10 were actually being compounded daily at a 25% interest rate. That means you owe me $1,000 $84.20 now, son. No, your Lunchables and Juicy Juice Box isn't going to cut it this time. You should have paid more attention in math. First step is exactly that. It's called extortion, I mean ownership. Own what you learn. The tiny dudes in your brain warehouse isn't going to carefully care for the packages being delivered unless the big boss upstairs says it's important to do so. If it wasn't apparent already, you are the big boss upstairs. The quickest way to ownership is to have a specific problem you want to solve. Ask yourself, what new superpower or door will I unlock if I seriously learn this? Answer may not be obvious, nor may it be immediate. But if you take the time to ponder this, and come up with something that truly motivates you, everything that enters your brain next is going to have immense purpose. If your plan is to take over the world, is knowing geography going to be helpful? How are you going to corner the transatlantic Pokemon card market if you don't even know where the Atlantic Ocean is? Oh no! Second step is called the jigsaw. There are many iterations and ways to do the jigsaw, but the idea is simple. If you want to memorize a 1000 piece jigsaw puzzle, you don't painstakingly memorize 1000 little pieces one by one. You put together the jigsaw puzzle first and then memorize the one cohesive scene in front of you. 1,000 individual data points reduced to just one, elegant and efficient. In other words, there's an order of operations when you learn. It's kind of like a set of Russian nesting dolls. The first layer is the big picture 50,000 foot aerial view. See the forest before you study the trees. Little by little do you then wade into the finer details. A great practical way to do this is what I call the ELI 5152565 concept, and in that order. Can you explain it to a 5-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 25-year-old with a master's, a 65-year-old with a PhD, a 100-year-old with late-stage dementia sitting in hospice care in need of a diaper change? Build the framework and foundation first before filling in the details. There's a reason you need to feed your brain this way. To explain, imagine there's a girl in front of you. Because you realize she's one, human, and two, alive, you know she's marriage material. This opportunity may not come again. Timidly, you ask for her number, and wow, she gives it to you. 617-405-8008. Her number is now a tiny little package in your head. It sits in short-term memory, the tiny receiving area of your brain at the front of the warehouse. Unfortunately, if you don't process this package soon, it's going to get lost in the never-ending stream of deliveries coming into short-term memory. How do you move something from short-term memory to long-term memory? You can't just hand it off to the dudes in the back of the warehouse because separating short-term memory and long-term memory is what I call the bottleneck of stupid. The bottleneck of stupid sounds stupid, but is in fact a very good thing. 
If it were not for this barrier, the millions of packages being delivered into your consciousness every second would soon overwhelm your hard drives, overwriting and erasing everything you hold dear. Because you're motivated to remember this girl's number, you put the package on a tiny workbench called working memory. It's called working memory because it's here that you get to work. Unfortunately, this workbench has only four to seven slots, a limitation no one can overcome. This is why you can only recall a few items on your grocery list at a time, why this girl's 10 digit number is stressing your brain out. It's also fundamentally why you must limit distractions. Having a distraction is you taking a slot out of service and literally dumbing down your brain. At this point, what do most people do? They brute force it. They attempt to smash the package through the bottleneck of stupid, repeating it 50 times in their heads, hoping it will stick. Unfortunately, brute force will not overcome the limitations of working memory, but the third step of learning will. It's called chunking. Combine what you want to learn into more digestible bite-sized chunks. By doing so, you can cravely fit larger items into the few slots you have. Check it, your girl's number isn't some random 10 digits, it's actually just three things. 617 is the area code for Boston, i.e. a pair of red socks. 58008 is actually just boobs written on a calculator upside down. And 40 is the 40 year old virgin you'll soon become if you don't freaking lock down this girl's number. Now collapse that into one perfectly concise image. Steve Carroll from 40 year old virgin wearing a pair of red socks, funneling a calculator. The more fun you have with it and the more emotionally salient it becomes, the more likely it will stick. Furthermore, this is how your brain encodes and retrieves all information anyway. It's that Russian nesting doll phenomenon again. Something needing 10 slots of memory collapses into three slots, collapses into one. For example, when you first learn a word, you need all the slots of working memory to piece together the letters, A, P, P, L, E. When you become more facile with it, your brain chunks it together into one word for efficiency, apple. Eventually, even the word itself just becomes part of a larger chunk, which in turn becomes part of another. The concept itself can even be borrowed and associated with other ideas. This is how you scale information and how intelligence is built. You either build a more massive library of chunks to choose from or increase how flexibly you can manipulate the chunks you already have. A true master like Leonardo da Vinci studies material in such an interconnected way that he's able to chunk material and see associations the average person cannot. This is how he's able to fit an entire library of knowledge into one slot, flexibly expanding and collapsing any part of it instantaneously, quickly zeroing in on the specific concept of interest. He does the same with the other slots and thus is able to elegantly manipulate larger swaths of data despite just having around five slots. Lots too. Because he's able to compare and contrast among five entire libraries worth of knowledge, expanding and collapsing them like a whimsical god, he's able to make connections between disciplines and see things no one else could possibly imagine. There's no reason why you can't build your brain in the same way too. Speaking of building up your brain, the perfect way to do so is with Skillshare. I've been looking to get better at doodling and all things Procreate. The animation app, I used to draw these little stick friends. Before Brooks's class, I was using my own slow manual workarounds to get the effects I wanted. Thanks to her intro to Procreate class, I now know how to use masks and other cool new features I never knew existed. Speeding up my workflow, like a pro. Skillshare is not just limited to art. It's actually the largest online community with thousands of classes led by industry pros. You have classes on writing, filmmaking, entrepreneurship, productivity, and much more. Their learning paths are hand-picked classes meant to upgrade your brain from the ground level. So it doesn't matter if you're just getting started or a more advanced learner. First 500 people to use my link in the description will receive a one month free trial of Skillshare. Get started today. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Fourth step is to let your mind wander. Conventional thinking has given daydreaming a bad rep. They tell kids to stop messing around, to snap to attention, and to stay laser focused on the task at hand. It's always about focus, focus, and pursuit of superhuman levels of attention and discipline. Unfortunately, too much of a good thing can be bad. In focus mode, you stick with one section of your brain library, zeroing in on the one book on the shelf. You force yourself to read and read 
reread it, convinced that the answer to the problem is somewhere there. This is the definition of narrow mindedness. Luckily, there's another way. The opposite of focus mode is diffuse mode. In the diffuse mode of thinking, you broaden your thought processes. When you let your mind wander, you inadvertently scroll through your entire library, scanning multiple shelves, even sections you didn't even know existed. And in doing so, you end up taking lessons from the hundreds of books you've read over your lifetime. Some random idea you learned ages ago, the exact key you need now, is sitting in that amorphous blob of thoughts waiting for you to find it again. This all happens unconsciously when you engage the diffuse mode. It's kind of like hitting the search button and scanning your entire brain for nuggets. Moreover, as the brain scans, it begins seeding and indexing this idea you just learned throughout your brain as relevant associations come up, making it that much harder to forget what you just learned. That's why when a concept just doesn't make sense, don't force it, simply step away. When you let go mentally, you engage the default mode network, a super highway connecting almost every region of your brain. As we've discussed in a previous video, your brain is really a small universe. You don't realize it, but somewhere in this brain universe is your eureka moment. It's literally in your head. You just have to find it, ponder over it in the background, give it some time, and it will come. That's why Eureka Moments happens when you least expect it. In the shower, on the toilet, when someone mentions something completely random. This is how you think outside the box, how you literally use your entire brain. Bottom line is this, learning happens not just when you focus on the task, not just when you sit down to learn, learning happens even when you step away, when you rest, when you disengage. To optimize your own learning, you must learn how to do both. Fifth step is space repetition. The first time I used space repetition was in medical school. Drinking from a fire hose of information, I needed a systematic way to ensure I didn't forget what I learned. Space repetition was the answer. The concept is stupidly simple. To not forget, you must review. The more you review, the less you'll forget. That's it really. Everything stored in your brain lives on what's called the forgetting curve. It's like that girl you met earlier. Her number, her face, her shoelace. It was all fresh in your mind when you just met her. Wait a few days later and the memory of it all becomes a bit more hazy. Are you sure you met a girl? She gave you her number? Really? Are you sure it wasn't a cardboard cutout of a girl? Or maybe it was a girl dog or a tree in the shape of a girl? Or maybe you just imagined it all. Think man, why would a girl ever want to talk to you? And dude, boobs? Boobs was literally her number? How stupid is that? As you work yourself up into a schizophrenic frenzy, the only way in which you can assure you aren't going crazy is by seeing her again. Seeing her again resets the forgetting curve, and this time, the memory is a bit more robust. It takes a little bit longer before you again begin to forget and descend into delusional paranoia. The beauty of space repetition is that there is software now that takes care of everything for you. Give each package of information a rating of how difficult it was to remember, and the software calculates the space intervals for you. Things that you remember well, you study at a less frequent cadence. Things that are harder to remember are pushed to you more frequently. There are some other nuanced weaknesses to space repetition I'll reserve for a future video, but the basic essence is sound. Spoiler alert, it almost resulted in me failing medical school. In short, these five simple steps should get you 90% of the way there. First is to take ownership of what you want to learn, have a specific problem you want to solve, and when you do, you'll naturally learn the most efficient tools needed to solve it. Second is the jigsaw. Efficient learning means understanding the big picture first before diving into the details. Be able to explain the concept to a five-year-old before trying to explain it to a patient with dementia. Third step is chunking in understanding how to go beyond the limits of your working memory. Fourth is to regularly intermix focus sessions with diffuse modes of thinking to solidify what you learn. Fifth is to regularly revisit what you learn using space repetition until it too feels like the back of your hand. There's a secret sixth step actually, but because it's so important, I've reserved an entire video for itself. When it's ready, I'll link it here. At any rate, I hope this video was helpful. If you want ideas and stories just like this delivered to your inbox, sign up for my Substack and get some digestible productivity tips sent your way today. If you want your very own custom-made character doodle to be part of all future video scenes I draw, then become a Patreon member. You can be yourself, a dog, or even a rock. Possibilities are endless. And finally, as always, best way to support the channel is to subscribe. Go tell your friends, your grandma, and your pet hamster. Smell you later.